Today, we continue the story of Joyra. Now, if you don't like Teferi, you're going to absolutely love what happens in this part of the story. Greetings, owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles. In our last installment of the Joyra lore, Joyra had gone ahead and broken one of the sacred rules of the island of Teleria. Now, what will this lead to? We'll find out in the future. But for now, the next part of the story takes part, takes place, I should say, one month later than the events of the previous video, okay? So, Joyra at this point is set to studying the power stones and schematics of Karn. Here's how it works. When Karn was created, certain students, certain high-level students, were allowed to witness the, essentially the birth of Karn. And as a result, they are required to give a report on Karn, the scenario of watching it, and also just basically what they've learned about Karn. Because unbeknownst to them, these particular students are being used as part of a larger project overall. So right now at this point, Joyra has to study the Power Stones and schematics of Karn because she does have her report that is due to Master Malzra, who if you're not aware is actually Urza Planeswalker. So any point that I refer to Urza in this video going forwards, I'll just use Urza because calling him Malzra gets confusing for people, all right? But either way, he, she's basically a student under Urza. She's required to turn in a report on Karn. Now, She's gone over in depth all the schematics that are available of Karn, and she studied the Power Stones, but there's nothing she can find in any of the documentation that explains Karn's intelligence or emotional capabilities. Karn is a singularly unique creation. I actually have a lore video talking about the origins of Karn and his first day, so if you want to know more about that, check that out. But either way, Karn is the first construct that Urza has created that has sentience, his own personality, and a high level of intelligence instead of just being a beast of burden. So, Joyra realizes the only way she's going to be able to complete this report is if she actually goes and speaks with Karn, but she's hesitant to do so. She really doesn't want to do so, and the reason for that is actually Teferi. Teferi has become essentially the gatekeeper to Karn. Karn has been thrown out into the wilds, as it were, by his creator Urza. Urza knows that Teferi is hassling Karn. In the, in the first video where we talk about Karn, you hear about how Karn, like Teferi is just awful to him, talking about how he's going to be destroyed and all this sort of thing. So Teferi is basically being left to his own devices to ruin Karn's existence, to just endlessly torture the poor creature. So Joyra doesn't want to deal with Teferi because Teferi has a massive, massive crush on Joyra. But Joyra's 18, Teferi's 14. She wants absolutely nothing to do with them, regardless of his age. And actually, there's rumors circulating around that Teferi has been trying to acquire some of Joyra's hair to create a love potion. So Teferi is not somebody that Joyra wants anything to deal with. Like, he, she's just like, okay, you know what? I don't want to deal with Teferi. He's going to be hitting on me here. And uh, I, I'm just, I, I can't stand this nonsense. But she realizes that she's going to have to fa basically face, face the music and go and deal with the scenario of Teferi guarding Karn. So she heads off and she finds Karn sitting in a great hall. He's actually res resting on a giant tree stump. And the reason for that is Karn is so massive. He's a gigantic, massive silver golem. He's actually broken three full-on benches, not chairs, actual benches meant to hold a number of different people. He smashed three of those already. So he's chilling on a giant tree stump looking absolutely miserable. Can you guess the source of his misery? If you guessed Teferi, ding, 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 you are correct. What is Teferi doing? Well, Teferi learned that if you actually levitate different vegetables around, you could end up inserting them into random holes on Karn's skull. So basically, he's treating Karn almost the same way that you would treat a snowman, right? Where you're just jamming random things on. But clearly, Karn is a living, feeling, thinking being. And he's only been alive for a month. Understand that while Karn has a gigantic metal body, 
and he looks like a full-grown individual. He's only been alive for a month, so he doesn't really know how to handle this. And he's looking, he's sitting there looking absolutely dejected and just completely miserable. Like Joyra, Joyra can feel the misery coming off of him in waves. So basically, Joyra starts to get irate at this point. Originally, she just came for information, but thinking about the nonsense that she's had to put up with Teferi and the fact that she, as an actual adult, is sitting there being concerned about having to interact with what is essentially still a child at this point, it starts to build her annoyance up. So she snaps at Teferi and says, does Urza know what you're doing? Remember again, this is Malzra, the secret. The, he's secretly Urza. Anyways, I'll, I said I'd call him Urza, so I'll stick to calling him Urza. So basically, Joyra goes, does Urza know what you're doing? And Teferi goes, hey, I'm a magical prodigy here. They know exactly what I'm doing, and I'm allowed to have this sort of freedom because I'm fantastic. I'm a magical prodigy. I'm the star student here at the Academy, and I can literally do whatever I want in this regard. Now, Joyra turns around and goes, okay, look, Karn, this is a living being. Like, he's not, he's not the same as automatons. This isn't like you're messing with a trash can or a book or something like that. This is a living, thinking, feeling being that you are torturing. And Teferi says, that's what makes it fun. Teferi literally comes out and it's like, yes, I am fully aware that he has emotions and can feel what I'm doing to him. And that's what makes it fun for me. Now, obviously, this is a genuinely awful thing to think. And you can see on one level, it's concerning, right? Because you have the behavior of people like when it comes to determining problems with children, one of the indicators they use is do these children like hurt animals and things like that, right? It can be a sign that people are damaged goods and maybe like mentally unwell. But at the same time, there is also just a lack of empathy that comes from being a child, an adolescent specifically. There's just something about going through the growing up process that is a little bit, like it's not dehumanizing, it's like being an unfinished human. So Teferi isn't pure evil, but he lacks empathy and compassion for other living beings. So Joyra, Joyra basically goes on like, what about potential damage to Karn here? And Teferi's like, oh, you know what? I'm just, I'm just testing him out. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's what, that's what Urza and Baron want. They just want me to put him through the paces and test out the machinery. And if it fails, it fails kind of thing. And then he continues onward to go, and I could test you out too, to Joyra. To which point, Teferi's crew is around him. You know, he's, he's a vicious little boy and you've got all of his little boy friends around him. So when he goes, I could test you out too, girl, that's when the, the chorus of friends do that. Ooh, you know, when you're watching like a sitcom, if you're old enough to remember like the old school shows where they actually had an audience in there and that like, ooh, so you've got the trills that are coming from basically the peanut gallery of Teferi's friends and supporters, right? And at that point, that's when Joyra goes off. She just starts calling Teferi a literal, like a little miserable infant who would carve the eyes out of a cat and destroy everything good in the world. He belongs in diapers because he's nothing more than a squalling infant. I'm not, when I, when I do these lore videos, I don't tell you absolutely every detail. So I'm not going to tell you word for word exactly what she said because there's more than what I said. Just to encourage you to go out and check out the novels yourself as well because in all honesty, there's a bunch of cool stuff that happens in the novels in terms of minor details and stuff that just don't get put into these lore videos because I'm not here reading the whole book to you. I'm just giving you an idea of the experience. So Joyra goes off and starts ripping into Teferi like hardcore. And remember what I just said, he's in front of all of his friends right now. So she is belittling and tearing into him in front of these people that he's bragging and showing off to. You know what I mean? You're a 14 year old kid. You don't have that strong a sense of self. So part of that is going to be based on what other people think of you and being made fun of in front of all these people right after he felt like he had scored like some points by, yeah, check it out. I could test you. Out. This is too much for poor little Teferi. And at this point, Teferi's face goes all pale and his lip starts to quiver like a tiny little child. And he basically is 
almost, almost breaking down full on into tears in front of his friends. But he's got that lip quivering, pale kind of thing going on, which is exactly what he deserves, man. If you, if you read the book, when you get to that point, you look, yeah, give it to him, Joyra, give it to him. So that part was pretty satisfying. Now, after, after this point, basically, Joyra takes Karn and says, like, let's go. We got to get out of here. I need, I need to speak with you, if that's all right, kind of deal. So Karn heads off with her, and they go back to Joyra's room, where they don't have to worry about any interruptions from people like Teferi. So she locks, she locks them in the room, but then at that point, she realizes that Karn is just like a new life. And here she is locked alone in a room with him, and he's this, like, giant hulking beast. And in one way, I mean, that does kind of show that she's treating him and thinking of him as a person, right? But in another way, she's intimidated and fearful. So she started to make small talk, just kind of talking about different things around her room, like, oh, look at this, and oh, and checked smoothing out the bed and whatever. And then she gets embarrassed by doing it because she thinks to herself, all right, you know what? Karn is a construct here. He's not going to care about these little things that humanity does. So she decides, you know what? Let's let's see if we have something in the room that that would be of interest to him. So she fishes out this special Viashino amulet. It comes from her homeland. Remember, we talked about her homeland in the previous episode and how it's this harsh, foreboding kind of land. Well, the Viashino amulets are made out of a very special metal that is very, very resilient and very, very strong. So she pulls up the amulet and says, you know what, Karn, this will be something that should be of interest to you. And she tosses it to him. And Karn reaches out his hand reflexive, reflexively to grab the amulet. And it actually ends up scratching up his hand, like his body, because he's a silver golem. And silver is not as strong as this special Viashino metal. It's actually one of the hardest substances in the entire plane of Dominaria, right? So at that point, she runs over to him and grabs his hand and she goes, oh, I'm so sorry. And then she starts to laugh and he's like, why, why, are you la why are you laughing at me? Did I do something funny? And she said, no, she's like, I was actually just about to grab a rag and try and clean your wounds the way I would do as if you were like a human being. You know what I mean? And he's like, huh? And she basically explains to him like, uh, like, I, I think of you as a person. I think of you actually as a friend. Now, this is a this is a pivotal moment for Karn, right? Remember this moment, because Karn now, this is the first time that Karn's being shown, like, true, friendly friendship. Baron tried to help mollify Karn, help to try and, like, I don't know, lessen the emotional impact of Urza seeming to not really give give any concern about Karn's emotions, Right. So you got this scenario now where Joyra has reached out in friendship to Karn. And then she says, hey, is it all right with you if I ask you some questions about your construction? And Karn is blown away by this as he goes, wait, like, you're, you're asking my permission instead of just telling me what to do. So at this point, like, Joyra has started to build rapport with Karn. And this is the, this is the beginning of their, what will turn out to be a long friendship but a friendship that will actually cause some drama and problems as well. But that that adds to the that adds to the story too. So she uh, she cleans up all the she since she has the rag she was going to use to clean Karn's hand or whatever. She cleans up all the vegetable bits and things like that that were on him to give him you know normal status, so he doesn't have to sit there feeling like a garbage receptacle. And then basically Joyra shows Karn the schematics of himself. So here's you as like outlines and blueprints. She explains her treatise is on how an automaton becomes thinking and feeling with the addition of a crystal. So she explains to Karn that the thesis, the article, the report that she's writing for Urza is specifically around the concept of how one of the beast of burdens turns from a mindless, unthinking, unfeeling tool into a living, feeling creature by adding in a power crystal, but she can't grasp but why what appears to be a dead power stone is what actually caused Karn's personality to manifest. Because at this point, she had only had experience with the Thran power stones. And it's not actually a power stone that's located inside of Karn. Karn says to her, 
He says it may not be a power stone. We actually know from the information in the story that it's not a power stone. It's actually something different. It is a heart stone. And that's something that is something created by Phyrexia for a completely different purpose. It's actually Xantia's heart stone that's being used here. So basically, Joyra starts asking, you know, some probing questions to try and, and flesh out her information about Karn. Like, okay, what is your purpose? What were you created for? You know, it's basically like, like, what were you created for? And also, I've noticed since your creation, there has been strangeness in the entire academy. Waves of wrongness. Now, Joyra can't put her finger on what's going on here. And that's because she doesn't know about the secret time experiments. We talked about these in the first Karn video. And the secret time experiments are, what are what's causing this strangeness and also why Karn was created. But Karn isn't allowed to tell her this. Like, Karn actually doesn't have to address this at this point. What happens next is there's actually a knock on the door from Baron because Baron has a very important request for Joyra. And that's where we're going to leave this part of the story, my friends. So let me know what you think about this installment of the Joyra lore. Seeing Teferi get mashed was pretty entertaining for me. We will have new lore videos on this channel every week. So if you want to support lore and see more of it, go ahead and join my Patreon. This channel is fan funded because YouTube pays virtually nothing. So if you want to support this and see more of my fun work, then please join up with my Patreon. Thanks for coming out, everyone, and I will talk to you all very soon.